Marina, one of the questions that I often have with people who have either been in the abduction or some sort of a relationship with what we call high strangeness of other intelligence. You were born in 2000. When you think back now, growing up, when was the very first memory of something that might have been a light in your room, a buzz in a closet, where you were, as a child, aware of something that was strange and becomes connected to the rest of your life. When was that very first memory? Well, Linda, when I was six years old, I was um, some sort of aware of my nature as a starseed or hybrid, and I... Okay, where, what I'm trying to get to is the very first awareness of anything, because you wouldn't automatically have the idea of a starseed. So yes. take us back to the very first memories of what you remember as being strange. When I was five years old, I told my parents that I was not from this planet, that I came from another planet. And they will ask me, well, how did you get here? Laughing, you know? Right. And I said to Sirius, I teleported to the womb of my mom. And at that moment, they become serious too, because how a child will be so convinced about that fact. But what were you seeing in your mind's eye that convinced you that you were from another planet? I was aware that I had abilities, psychic abilities, that were not, that other people didn't have. Like? Like, I will use my intuition to find objects. I will manipulate the weather as I want it. And I will have dreams with extraterrestrials that, to me, felt familiar enough for, to not be afraid of them. Okay, now that's the area that I'm asking about. What was the very first dream that you remember at what age and what were you seeing in the dream? The very first conscious dream, it was when I was a child, but I was not able to interpret it correctly. So I just thought, well, these are some beings, but I didn't thought these are extraterrestrials and I didn't know the story, you know, the... What were you seeing in the dream? I was seeing uh, ETs of blue skin. Blue skin? Yes. And when you say ETs, did you know as a child that they were extraterrestrial or? No, I didn't. Thought, I mean, I thought they, were, they came from another planet, yes, but I didn't thought about them as my star family. But why as a young child would you even think of extraterrestrials? What did you say to your mom and dad about your I was dream? obsessed about it and I didn't know why. And the blue, what color blue that I would know and you would know? Light, light, light blue. So you remember having dreams from say age five on, trying to talk with your parents about dreams in which you were seeing something that wasn't human, but you didn't really understand what it was. How long from age five did you live with dreams? And then when did it transition into something that was telepathic? Can you tell us from age five on what was progressing and what was happening? So until 15, I was completely unaware of um, the whole phenomenon, what's going on on Earth and Earth history. But I had this knowing that of my hybrid nature. And but you were just having dreams as a young child about these other beings. Yes. It's, there must have been a transition point, yes. either in dreams or in telepathy, like in a room. Yes. What was the we'll call it the pivotal moment that you realized it wasn't just dreams that you were being communicated with by other entities. So the dreams have stopped when I was growing up. I forgot a little bit about this and I continue my life normally as any other child. Of course, having psychic experiences but not in communication with these beings. But at age 15, when my first memory came, about abductions, and I started to be become visited by 
extra dimensional beings and have downloads of information. That's with it, that's the pivot point in which everything started to come. And what's important is at age 15, compared to the young five-year-old having dreams, what happened? Was it a physical interaction with you in your house? How did the first relationship where you knew that you were dealing with something that was from another planet, how did that start? It started with really strong downloads of information of really complex metaphysics and physics. Give an example. Um, for instance, is the structure of existence, the mechanics of consciousness. And like what would have been communicated to you as fi a 15 year old? Um, I wanted to be a physicist, so I wanted to make a sense of existence. So by answering that question and questioning the evolution of humanity, if we were really like a transition from a uh, hominid or rather like a hybrid and genetic experiment, that's when the heavy downloads came and that's when I started to get uh, questions to things that a 15 year old will never know. Not reading a book, not having read any book in her life. Can you give an example so the audience could relate? What would be the question that you would ask and then you would start getting a download in your mind's eye, seeing images, hearing sound. What would be an example of information coming to you? Yeah, give an example so that people would understand what you mean at age 15, that you were getting a download from something related to physics of the universe. Well, I asked about God, about how is that we exist? And I got a paradox. I got a, uh, an answer that is paradoxical that says we exist because non-existence couldn't exist because it will be the denying of existence. And only if existence exists, non-existence could exist. And that's why there is existence. And then I asked about God and they told me I got the information coming from me telepathically that give me the vision that God is an all that is force and everything that exists are infinite frequency modulations of that same energy that we call God and is fractalized and the purpose behind God and the universe existing and fractalizing into infinite aspects of itself is because God by being everything it was nothing at the same time so God wanted to be someone, and that's why it fractalized itself to become someone. And the only number that God could divide itself by definition, technically, mathematically speaking, is infinite, which is an abstract number. And this whole concept that I've heard from many people in the abduction syndrome is fractals the geometry of fractals, frequency is the essence of the universe and the essence of infinity with the mathematical fractals always repeating, yes. which in a way it sounds like what you're talking about. Definitely. Now to somebody who is listening, who might be another 15 year old, you are getting information about a God force that is infinite and recreating itself mathematically and in frequencies so that its non-existence would not be what prevailed, which would mean there was nothing. Today, we're talking in 2022, you're 22 years old. Uh, what is your perspective right now on the intelligence that has been putting these downloads into you for the last 22 years? I have to say that I will divide that collective into the ones that are not agenda based, which are all about experience for expansion, for spiritual expansion and experience, and the ones who have an agenda that unfortunately have been, been the ones that have um, been manipulating and controlling deeply 
the awakening of humanity and all these scenarios. And which type would this be and why? My personal experience ranges from the agenda base, the very agenda base and the non-agenda base. So I have a mix, a duality of both of them. But what would be the agenda of those that are denying their existence to humanity? You mean the people who deny they exist? Right. Yeah. What are those entities? What are they like? What do they look like? And why are they denying information? Well, um, what kind of information are you asking? Maybe I misunderstood. I thought you were saying that you've got telepathic download from beings that are trying to show you the essence of God frequency and why the universe exists. Yes. And that then there are others that are trying to block that information from humans. More than blocking that information, they are using it for an agenda. They're, they're controlling how it gets to people. What kind of information gets to people's consciousness and subconscious, which is the most important part, to then apply an agenda to that? Well, I think a lot of people, especially 22-year-olds watching, they would want to know, how do you interact with these other intelligences? Are you taken in a beam of light into a craft and facing and getting telepathic downloads? Um, what is your relationship with the non-humans that you feel are trying to show you that the universe is related to a God force that is based on math? I mean, how does that work versus others that are trying to block. I think that I'm hearing from you. There are those that are giving you information and you're aware of others that are trying to block all of humanity from knowing the truth. So what do they look like and why are some trying to communicate and others trying to block? We need to understand that. So the beings that are responsible for my downloads that explain to me all these dynamics and the structure of existence are called Anunnaki, but there are various kinds of Anunnaki. Those specifically are blue-skinned, and they have a connection to what we will call the Celtic um, people from Earth. They are connected to specifically one important civilization from the past that they call Hyperborea, and they taught me history and their background. And the hyper Hyperboreans. Yes. Um, and their connection, the Anunnaki is a word that the world knows from ancient history. And you, you are saying that you feel that who is communicating with you is a current living version of the Anunnaki. Um, yes, but... And they're the blue-skinned. Yes. But what um, many people don't understand is that Anunnaki is nowadays a very general term because it's a species made of many different races and sub-races. So the, even in between them, they have political conflicts, they have different mixing of genetics, they have different histories, they have different, uh, let's say, paths of evolution. So Anunnaki is quite general. I will say. But there was a group that had ropey headdresses, elongated heads, uh, held rods that uh, I have been told were language communicators directly with human brains. And that Anunnaki group, Enlil, Enki, and all of the stories, that they were an extraterrestrial civilization that came from another star solar system, put uh, a base on Earth and were involved with genetic manipulation of already evolving primates to create what we call Homo sapiens sapien. So the Anunnaki would have been genetic engineers on the Earth of different life forms. Correct. What would they want today? That's a question that um, can't be really asked because of what I said about the fact that Anunnakis are made of many different sub-races. So there are some races of Anunnaki who want control on Earth. And there are some of them 
who want to liberate Earth and leave humans um, that kind of freedom to evolve naturally without more genetic iterations, without control and manipulation. So that's why we have a lot of conflict in our history to the day of today, the because they're behind the scenes. What category do you put yourself in, in terms of there are human abductees, meaning they are taken in beams of light, they're in craft, sometimes on another planet, there's communication face to face with beings. Uh, there are other cases where it's dreams and it appears to be communication only. Then there are people who say that they are a product of genetic manipulation ongoing, a creation of hybrids on the earth that even government political systems treat as possibly a threat to yes. earth. What category are you in? And if you can describe what you feel that you are right now in this whole huge complex story. So I will define myself as a hybrid a product of genetic engineering. I was given extraterrestrial genetics. Um, I'm also an experiencer of breeding programs, those that you mentioned that are a threat to humanity that I kindly agree. And um, my, so my genetics were taken to create hybrid babies, which I am not um, okay with. It, what is your personal understanding of what has happened between you and the Anunnaki and a genetics program that would involve taking souls? So the beings known as the Grace are the main species that are behind this breeding program. The reason why is because they are a dying race. They are in, at the face of in extinction and they claim to be us from the future so that they convince people that we are somewhat related genetically so that we develop compassion and actually agree on a higher level or a lower level to give away our genetics. And they're doing this. And I have to say that I consider this to be one of the greatest threat in human evolution right now because I had experiences when I confronted them and I exposed them to the public the real intentions. When I did that, I was attacked by them to the point in which I almost passed away. Okay, how did they attack you? Psychically. And what were you seeing, feeling? My breathing was not normal. My tension was getting way too high out of no reason. And the explanation that I got from my contact, um, extraterrestrial you know, uh, contacts, is that there is an inner technology inside the human soul that is called the Merkava. It's basically, in physics, uh, understanding. It's two vortex of energy spinning in different orientations. That is what uh, creates a stable human vessel that is you know, um, available for the soul that is um, um, great, um, let's say, attunement for the soul to be able to manifest itself in material, in material form. When it spins into different directions, when it is manipulated and it's not balanced, illness, sickness, and even death can occur. And you see, are you seeing in your mind's eye or are you seeing in front of you in actual 3D space grays that are overseeing a process that you associate with taking your soul to apply to them? It was astral experiences, what, we, what people will call out-of-body experiences. I will go to sleep as if it was a normal day and I will, my soul will get pushed out of my vessel and I will find myself on a craft and I will see the greys and the babies and I will see them experiment on me. And which grey are you seeing? There are some that have pointed chins, there are some that are like an upside down pear shaped like a U. Which type of grey are you seeing? They are about 
um, this tall. They are light about skin. four feet. Yes, and I have pointed chin and really big, large eyes. Which is completely different than the EBIN, the acronym Extraterrestrial Biological Entity, which has pear-shaped heads. Have you dealt with pear-shaped EBINs or only with the pointed chins? With the pointed chins. And the pointed chin has been identified on Earth as being a species that many people in the abduction syndrome associate with negative. Why are the pointed chins focused on Homo sapien? Because they want to impose their genetics on this planet so that they can be introduced energetically because everything is about frequency and vibration but mostly DNA which is a program. Um, it's, it's basically frequency patterns it's physics. So if someone is able to control the frequency patterns that are programmed within the DNA structure of one species, that galactic blueprint, they can't insert themselves. They can manipulate the evolutionary course of that species. Now I'm assuming then that you have information about what our government of the United States is doing to block the frequency manipulation by the pointed chin grays. I have had abductions, military abductions, in which the, the beings that were inside the craft, which are government um, um, people, also helped me save my life and helped me get away from these scenarios and attacks from the grays. Did you feel like you were talking to a normal human in military dress? Yes, and they also communicate through me through an etheric implant that was placed in my head and I often have communications with them. Can you give the, uh, what you remember of the communication with the first military person that you had interaction with? The first interaction, conscious interaction with this military group was when I recover my memories about my, um, let's say, experience in what people call the secret space program or the dark fleet, which is the Nazis and the German um, space programs. That was the first time that I came in contact with groups that are factions within the SSP, the secret space program, but that has separated and are no longer on the same let's say, mission or agenda, and help me, you know, recover my memories, and also they help me um, save my life from the grays. Well, let me ask you a historic question. Adolf Hitler, leading up to World War II, talked to people about the fact that he was working with extraterrestrials from the solar system, Aldebaran, that sun. Correct and that they were blonde, blue-eyed, and that he was going to, in the war, make it possible for the Aldebaran blonde, blue-eyed beings to help him and then to take over the world and get rid of what he considered to be a reptilian presence on the earth. That was in the 1930s leading up into what we all know as World War II from the, in the first five years of the 1940s. Has either humans or the pointed chins showed you actual images of beings that were blonde, blue-eyed and explained were they from the Aldebaran star system, and what would be the current, I guess you would say, status lay of the land of those blonde, blue-eyed extraterrestrials who communicated with Hitler, and we know what happened in World War II, are they still a viable entity trying to take over the planet Earth today? Yes, that's correct. I got contact 
from the beings from Aldebaran. They told me telepathically in an astral experience. They took me also out of my body. They said, you have to go in actions to us because in one or two or three incarnations, I don't remember how many I had, they said in general, you were one of us. You were a being from Aldebaran. You have parallel incarnations as one of our species. And they told me also that I had two incarnations in that period of time in which um, in, during uh, World War I and World War II. In one of them, I was a medium lady who was part of a really famous society that started the whole thing, the contact with the beings from Aldebaran. Uh, I was a real medium. I channeled those extraterrestrials. Do you mean the real society? The real society. And the real V-R-I-L became the names of the alleged UFOs being built underground in Piena Munde by Hitler. Correct. Do you know information about who was exactly creating those virile machines? Sure. It was the German military. And in fact, there was a, there were conflict. There was a conflict because the Draconians, the Draconian Empire, knew the plans of the Aldebaran people and they wanted to take over. And that's when the Nazis became you know, um, became what they are to the day of today. The they started to, um, they created the genocide of thousands of lives and they started to um, become more um, aggressive and take a different path from the original mission. Because many of them were actually manipulated from behind the scenes in the astral by these draconian um, entities or species. And that's when they split. And Maria Orsic, who was the principal medium of that society. A blue-eyed, blonde-haired female. Yes. She said, we are no longer staying here. And she left and went to Aldebaran because they observed that they were taking a different path and they were being influenced by the draconian people. And the ones who were influenced by these draconians, these reptiles, they are the ones who are now called the Dark Fleet. The Dark is, Fleet. Which is a negative group. And the positive news is that Maria Orsic has came back to Earth and I got communication, telepathic communication experiences with her. And what was her priority to tell you? Well, in my other life, in that period of time, I was an SS general and I happened During World War II. Yes. And I happened to be her lover. And what was Maria Orsic's, I guess I want to say, what was her priority in returning now to the Earth in this timeline? Help humanity's ascension. And how do you see that occurring? I see that they are working with the group of the Germans, of the Nazis that didn't took the bad path, let's say, and became a breakaway civilization or even what we call positive secret space program groups or factions because they exist and they are working with the good extraterrestrials. Some of them are in inner Earth, some of them are in Antarctica, some of them live in ships or in other parts of the solar system. And they... What about Mars? Yes, Mars, unfortunately, is a place that is um, utilized by the Dark Fleet a lot. Because in some of my regressions about my SSB experiences, I saw myself working as a super soldier slave in Mars laboratories. So I don't think that the good Germans or the good Nazis are actually there. And that the overall priority is to do what? From Mars to Earth to Aldebaran, what is the main goal? Of which group? The positive? All, all of them. What, what is the conflict about? What are the current Aldebarans, Anunnaki, what is it that they want? What is the group on Mars? What is at stake here? Well, the Dark Fleet, the ones that are collaborating with the Draconian Empire and the Orion Empire, 
they are basically, their plants are basically creating a race of super soldiers that will have the psychic abilities, mental abilities, physical abilities to become what they call Aryan or superhuman, ubermenschen, and basically use them to take the world. To take Earth. Yes, and the positive ones have the agenda of liberating humanity from that reptilian presence. What is it that the reptilian presence wants from Earth? What is their priority? Well, they are bearing for, they are species, they are beings that are from different densities of consciousness. Density of consciousness, a higher density of consciousness, means that they have more reintegration with their higher mind, more dimensional depth as to the, stru as to the structure of existence. But it does not mean, though, that they have a more positive state of being necessarily. That has more to do with the soul development, with the heart space. So they're more intelligent, they're more advanced, and in the food change, if we will compare it or use that example, they are over us. So they need to feed to energetically and animals because they are lower density than us. They have less energy. So instead of feeding from their energy, they feed for us humans. But it seems like that there are two main arenas here. Yes. There are physical extraterrestrial beings in different solar systems and that some of them want to claim the territory of Earth as theirs so that they could run operations here. But then there seems to be a whole other perspective that gets into why the hybridization, why the tanks on UFOs with babies, that there is some goal by some form of the greys to have interaction with souls. So you've got soul activity and generation of bodies by greys, but you have also this issue of claiming Earth as territory. And it's not really clear what is the reason that any of them are fighting each other over claiming Earth as their territory because they have genetic connections to us. It's a repeating cycle from, I will say, millions of years in Earth's history, in humanity's history. So they all have some small tie or connection or even higher connection to us genetically because they became part of the genetic massive experiment of creating the human race. And so they see that as a an open door, an opportunity of imposing their genetics by, you know, frequency mani manipulation, consciousness control, and by doing so, they can take over the planet itself and control the course of evolution. But I haven't heard you talk about the tall whites and the Nordics, yes. which military people and aerospace people uh, tell me that we have I guess help would be the word from tall whites and Nordics and you haven't mentioned them. Have you had any experience with these seven to eight foot tall color of chalk whites yes. and the Nordics that are blonde, also blonde and blue eyed uh, making the whole complex who is who so difficult? Those are the ones that I um, identify as Aldebaran beings. The blonde, blue-eyed. So the ones who contacted me and tell me that I had incarnations as one of them, those were tall, white Nordics. Okay, their Nordics are, can be six to seven feet tall with blonde hair and blue eyes. The tall whites are a completely different order. They usually are at least eight feet tall by the time they interact with humans. They are the color of chalk. Everything is white. The hair is white. The skin is white. Their clothes are white. Uh, and their eyes can be a pale blue. But they are a distinct order. But it doesn't sound like you've had any interaction with them at all. 
and it's hard to understand the geopolitical complexities of what is happening in Earth historically and currently if we actually do have help from Nordics and tall whites working directly with our aerospace and military versus pointed chin grays or Ebens or uh, Aldebarans, it would seem that there is that there is some kind of discrepancy between saying we're getting help from tall whites and Nordics, but you're describing a whole mixed group that they want territory and they want souls that is not ascribed to these others. It's that complexity of agendas that don't make any sense. The Aldebaran means are actually blonde, blue-eyed, entities that you are describing. Can you just wait a second? Yes. <laughs> okay, we can start. They are not related to... Start the full sentence, okay. The other brand beings that I was mentioning in my story were actually Nordic looking, as you describe them, to be, and the ones that are helping humanity and are working with the uh, military. Um, Blonde, blue eyes. Exactly. About six feet. Exactly. So they are not related, they are not aggressive, they don't want to take over, and they are not related to the point of Jean Grace. That's another story. But you have not had any interaction at all with the seven to eight foot tall, tall whites. Yes. You have not had any. I did. Well, then talk about that, because that is really, to me, one of the great mysteries. If they are helping us, why is that help not more dominant? They are helping us, and the reason why it's not more, it doesn't seem to be more dominant, is because as they are not agenda based, their help becomes to our eye and our, let's say, perception more passive rather than active. But it is there. The only difference is that they cannot interact. Um, with us on the level that we expect them to do because that will be crossing the line of one big uh, universal law that says that species should not interact with the evolutionary course of one of other species because otherwise they will take away their ability or opportunity to grow spiritually and in consciousness. But in contradiction to that are the pointed chin grays yes. that are interacting with creating genetic hybrids, are trying to hijack souls. So the idea that there's a universal law of non-intervention, it doesn't apply to most of the interactions. I understand your um I understand your um, shock, you know. Well, the, it, there's a contradiction here. Yes. Because I, maybe only one species, the tall whites, are actually trying to live by, we are not going to live life for you, but we're going to help you. While all these other species, even going back to World War II and Hitler, they are actively interacting with the Earth. They are actively interrupting other people's human lives. Historically, genetic manipulation of already evolving primates on this planet to create humanity is a gigantic interference, right? It so is. if the tall whites are the only ones that are actively trying not to live the life of Earth and are trying to help from the outside, all the rest of it is interacting and interrupting human evolution. Yes. So, so isn't that violating the whole universal law? Well, I want to explain to you why it actually seems like this. First of all, the Tao Whites are not the only ones who are helping humanity. But um, second, second um, point is that um, the reason why we observe it to be like this, that the ones that are, in, that are aggressive and negative oriented are intervening and the ones who are posit positive are not and are more passive, is because it all ties to metaphysical dynamics in terms of consciousness. There, are, there is a higher self in, the fifth, in what we call the fifth dimension. 
which is a higher frequency in which we are all conscious. We are super conscious. It goes beyond the physical mind's understanding, even the subconscious understanding of one and so one um, self. Um, that self is aware of all kinds of co-creations that they are um, actually performing in this incarnation, in their incarnation in Earth, in this physical plane, and is the one who makes soul contracts or agreements with different kinds of beings, being positive or negative. Why do they make soul contracts? Because there is an exchange of energy there that the soul, um, the, the higher mind benefits from because there is a learning lesson there that we can take to, as an opportunity to take that aspects of our consciousness to get integrated and heal within our DNA and become more evolved and, um, well, because um, otherwise there wouldn't be any kind of point of experience in the physical reality. Do you have a soul contract with an extraterrestrial? Everyone has. But what would it be like to you? What would the soul contract mean? Soul contract means that before or during an incarnation, an expression of one's soul in the physical matrix, there is an agreement on a higher level that there's going to be an interaction, that there's going to be an exchange of energy, of information. So sometimes it is a negative kind, it is polarized to be a negative experience or a change of information and energy, and sometimes it's positive. And so for me and for everyone, it is polarized that way. We have positive and negative. But what would be the value of negative? Experience and the opportunity of a spiritual growth and expansion. Today, we're speaking on September 9th, 2022. You're 22 years yes. old. Have you been shown the future in terms of a timeline for you? When I asked about the future, what they told me is that the Earth has an electromagnetic field, right? That is like the aura or the energetic etheric body of its own, the consciousness matrix. Well, that electromagnetic field contains quantum waves of probabilities. They told me that the ones that are stronger are the ones that are the highest probability of manifestation in terms of physics into the physical matrix. And that's why people seem to read the future, to have that ability, because they're reading the strongest waves of quantum probabilities. But they told me that they're reading physics. They're not reading a factual event that is going to f happen. It's not determined. It is a probability. So. Well, right, Nothing is fixed yet. Right now, uh, I would say from 2020 to 2022, I've talked with dozens and dozens of people in the abduction syndrome. They can have positive or negative events, but all of them sense that we are headed toward some kind of huge depopulation of the Earth human population. Have you been shown or encountered any information about what is going to happen between now and 2030? Sure, so they told me that the Earth has its own consciousness and it's shared in an integral with all the consciousness, individual consciousness that, um, of the beings that live in it, in its ecosystems. They told me that the Earth has decided that it's going to move into a higher uh, density, a more, let's say, evolved state of consciousness. Like a meet. fifth dimension. Exactly. But the Earth itself, you're saying, has a consciousness and that the Earth itself would try to make a dimensional move as opposed to all of these conflicting entities good, bad, and in between that use Earth as a laboratory, wouldn't they have more impact on what was going to happen? Actually, the negative interactions taking place are part of the process of getting to that high level of consciousness. Because consciousness 
there's only consciousness. And what is unconscious is disintegrated, is what we call darkness, which is the narratives of conflicts and you know, negative interactions. That part is consciousness too, but it's unconscious because it's not integrated into balance, into a state of harmony with the self. So once that unconscious aspect of our collective, of the earth, of the population of humanity, gets integrated and aligned with source, with balance, then it's when we will make that quantum jump to that higher density of consciousness. So it's part of the process. And don't you want to sometimes just yell at the universe, why? <laughs> why is there conflict, death, dark? Why is the pulse of the yin and yang seemingly dominating a universe in which it would make more sense if the thought that dwells in the light were in total control? if there would not be any darkness or hate or war. Why is this not a peaceful universe from beginning to end? Because polarities. But what creates the polarities in the first place? Polarity is not a division of one element. Polarity is the disintegration of that unified element in the first place. So let's say that they create each other so that the one entity may be a being, a self, a soul, or a collective can make sense. Because without one aspect of it, being it the negative pole or the masculine or the left side brain, the logical, the other one will not make sense. Let, it, let me explain with an example. If you, see at the, if you look at the universe and you think of the idea of that there is a structure, if there will only be a structure without meaning, without contact, then a structure wouldn't make sense, wouldn't exist. Because what creates that structure? What is creating? It will be nothing, so it will not exist itself. But if there is meaning, creative meaning added to that structure, then the structure makes sense and it is named a structure of something. It will be the same with meaning. If a meaning has no structure, it cannot make sense. Thus, it cannot exist. So duality, polarity needs to exist in order for the individual entities that we know as the universe or consciousness itself to exist. Well, we're talking now about the dimension of, let's say, third dimensional frequency that the Earth is currently in. Uh, some abductees talk about being shown fifth dimension or sixth dimension. What does a different dimension mean to you and have you been shown so that you really were seeing another dimension and which frequency would it have been? Dimension is a place, a physical place, not like a location, but rather a physical uh, spectrum of, of place in space and time, in which the frequency and vibration is fixed to a determined you know, tune. It has its own signature frequency. So when many people say that we're going to the fifth dimension, they're Doing, they're making a mistake or they're misunderstanding a little bit the concept, the metaphysical concept. What we're doing is transitioning towards the fourth density of consciousness. Density is about state of being. It's about the evolution, the awareness of one consciousness. Dimension. It's, a, it's a frequency, right? It's, it's a and state the, of being. The, the difference between dimensions would be frequency, if, even if we don't fully understand that. that, the, that if we went to the fifth dimension, we may not be able to interact with anything in the matter world as we do now in the third dimension. It's always been confusing. How could matter beings be taken to a fifth dimension where their hands would not even be able to interact with anything that was there? That's because we're um, multidimensional. And our being, I mean our bodies, have many facets, fractal facets 
that are operating or vibrating at different levels and existing at different frequencies at the same time. So usually, many people talk about physical material abductions in which we actually get um, physical face-to-face -face interactions. But there are other kinds of abductions in which our, let's say, the blueprint of our physical consciousness that exists first as a holographic um, element gets abducted. So that way, the information that gets exchanged gets directly towards the physical conscious, which, consciousness which, without necessarily having to take the materialized, crystallized form of the physical consciousness itself. If the whole dynamic of the universe, let's say maybe the universe is 12 dim dimensions, and we're in third, and we hear about fifth, sixth, it doesn't really, I don't think, register with human minds, because we're in a matter world experience, and when we put our hand on a chair, it doesn't go through the chair. If we suddenly were in the fifth dimension, our hands might not be able to interact with anything, and there's that effort to try to understand what are other dimensional existences, and why do beings that interact with you and others, why do they give impressions where people will say they were trying to show me a fifth dimension or another dimension, and other humans just don't understand that at all. But in that context, to me, one of the greatest mysteries of all Earth history, who really are the avatars, the Krishna, the Buddha, Christ, Joseph Smith to the Mormons, Muhammad for Mesopotamia? Who are they really? And how do they fit into this idea that we're in a universe that is polarized between black and white. The yin and yang symbol is the metaphor for this universe. And yet there's communication to military aerospace and people in the abductions that there are other dimensions and that eventually this planet might end up in a fifth dimension. But what are the avatars? Well, these avatars are actually representations of aspects or even, I would say, archetypes of consciousness. But what is an archetype for the general person watching? An archetypal structure generally is a structure of meaning, an aspect of our consciousness. Consciousness has its own map of different aspects of itself, such as we observe in the chakra system. Um, so an archetypal energy will represent an idea, a general idea. So that is combined even of many different ideas, like in a fractal system. So that's why we have deities even in our history, and communication and contact and experiences with what we call deities such as deity is the word you would be substituting for what I'm calling the avatar but the avatar to me it, it is a closer word because avatar is supposed to be a representation of a spiritual and matter entity both and that if you look at the history of the last 2000 years there have been these appearances of Krishna and Buddha and Christ and Mohammed and Joseph Smith, at least those five, with different perspectives, different perspectives, on the essence of soul, matter, and spirit. That's why they're different. And it is in the differences of the avatars that I find confusion. Why should there be differences if the large mind with a capital M, the thought that dwells in the light, if it has a singular goal to annihilate all that is negative, 
that souls, all souls throughout infinity would choose to come back to the light, always. Why would there be darkness? Why would there be pointed chins that want human souls? Well, um, avatars are actually representations on, of not just one archetypal energy, maybe, but rather many kinds of archetypes and even consciousness that are behind the co-creation of the incarnation and the life, the channeling of information of that or the sharing, the public sharing and, and giveaway of information and service to that collective. What would control the coming of these different avatars? What will control? Yeah, why, from where, at the times that they came, why would the avatars be inserted in the timeline of Earth at any point? What would be making that decision? And what would be the goal of the avatar? It will be the collective of the humanity itself. What would be inserting the avatar? It will be representing aspects of consciousness, such as Christ consciousness. What we call Christ consciousness is the consciousness that is aligned with source. But what would be deciding when Krishna would be inserted, Buddha would be inserted, Christ would be inserted, Muhammad would be inserted, Joseph Smith. Is that extraterrestrial control, meaning other entities in other solar systems, or something else? It is usually our collective system on a higher level, making that agreement all together. Something tells me that this is a question, though, that you do not have an easy answer to. None of us have an easy answer. Because <laughs> sometimes it's control, or sometimes there's an agenda behind those avatars, I will say. But many times, those avatars are decided to be born and represent what they came to represent by the collective of humanity itself that is operating on a higher level that our physical minds happens to be not aware of. So we cannot really tell from this perspective when, when we decided it, for what we decided it. So it, it's not an easy answer for sure. Right. Have you been shown, either by entities or in dreams or telepathic thoughts that put images in your mind, have you been shown the future that you're on a timeline and what is going to happen that you see in the future? I have been shown visions of the most probable future to manifest for me. Everyone happens to manifest their own future because we are individual consciousness even though there's a collective. But for me, I have had visions being given to me of how I was living in a new earth in which we were working with the good guys. <laughs> and they look like what in your vision? They have many different aspects. Um, they have the Nordic look, for example, that you described. Light, blonde hair. Yes, but they're also blue skinned, ET, such as the ones that are working with me. The government calls them teals. Oh, interesting. Yes. But inside the teals or that description, many different races can fit into that description. So. It's complicated because there are many, many extraterrestrial groups and sub races of a species. So we cannot just generalize into Nordics or blues or there is a lot within them to, at the same time. So and the bottom line, why has Earth been in so many territorial conflicts with ETs over who is going to control Earth? Because Earth is a playground, let's say, and a scenario in which many of the karmic cycles of energy or evolution of all the races that are part of our genetic makeup is being played at the moment. So they have great interest in what happens with humanity's evolution because we hold their DNA, their genetic information, so we are connected to their consciousness. That way, what happens with us influences to 
their evolution and their consciousness. Do you think that every being at every level of every dimension ultimately either wants or has been shown that its big goal is to evolve out of the dimension that they're in? Generally, yes. Uh, most of the species or consciousness are shown that there is a constant in the universe that is called evolution. It's not a matter of action, it's not a matter of will. It's the constant of the universe. But you can either expand your consciousness, which will be a positive evolution, or you can contract your consciousness, which many will call devolution. But the philosophy behind it is that there's no such thing as devolution, because if you get to more darkness, even if it's a negative move, some wise people or beings, entities, will tell you that that is an opportunity for growth because you are getting to know aspects of your consciousness that were not in balance or in, let's say, alignment before, that now you can integrate and expand. In the Christian Bible, in Matthew, there is this sentence, he who believeth in him who sent me shall have everlasting life. Raising the whole issue of why are there consciousnesses that would have long lives, perhaps infinite lives, but we're on a planet of humanity in which our lives are extremely short. What do you think that's about, infinity versus short lives? I was told that um our genetics has been manipulated continuously over the time course of history and in some of those genetic iterations that have happened in the past the Anunnaki decided for a reason that I am not aware of that they wanted our lives to be shorter. Less competition for them maybe? I'm, un I'm unaware of the reason why they do it. I will have to channel it but... Um, you could try Yes. Doing that and let me know? Yes. Can you try now? Yes. So they're, they're telling me that it has to do with the idea of how the different aspects, multidimensional aspects of the soul which involves the mind, the subconscious, the physical body, etc., the astral body, the, the, the other bodies within the astral um, spectrum. Like the Egyptian had nine variations. Yes. Um, since they grow and expand in cycles of energy, which is directly connected to numerological uh, patterns, they are hinting me that it has to do with that, with how we get to develop all those bodies. And when it's time to, let's say, finish our experience on Earth based on how we have developed. It's not fair we have such short lives. It is, but as I was telling you before, Maria Orsic, which supposedly was born in, in another century. She's still alive. And the reason why she's still alive is because she was being, she, she was taught by the extraterrestrial beings that she's in contact with, how to use this energy that we call Vril, which is the name of the society itself, to actually expand the light of your life and even heal disease and sickness. Well, see, the tall whites are supposed to be able to live for 800 years. They've communicated that. That comes from people who have dealt with them in the military and the aerospace. And then I was told this intriguing fact that even though they were made to live 800 years and then they could manage solar systems better, that they choose to pass out of their body 
at around age 500. Nobody has explained why that would be. Have you heard of anything like that where there would be long lives, 800 years, but the beings themselves would choose to pass out of matter existence earlier? Yes, it has to do with, similar to what I was explaining about patterns of frequent, uh, uh, patterns, sorry, of energy and time. Um, every year, for example, is a cycle of evolution, of transformation, of expansion. So this is all, this all has to do with the cycles, you know, that goes inside the soul of expansion, of transformation, of evolution. So depending on how they have structured the idea or their concept or perception of a space and time, they may have decided collectively that they want to pass out at 800 years from human perspective because they consider that it's enough revolutions or patterns of, of time, of, of frequency, cycles, not patterns, sorry, cycles of energy. And if that's true, then what you're implying is that our creation with less than 70 year lives it almost seems punishment. It depends on anyone, uh, every individual's perspective. But yes, I think one should be able to live longer. But actually, people like Maria Orsic is showing us that it is possible if we get to a point of enlightenment or let's say, a farther in evolution in which we're actually able to manage this universal energy that they call it real, to stand our lives to a longer length. But it's currently, as I understand it, it is purely philosophical because I don't know anyone who has ever seen proof that, let's say, Maria Orsic or anybody from World War II had extended lives in Aldebaran. And that's one of the problems with all of this. It's so inaccessible to the general homo sapien and that it sounds like all philosophy. And what would you say to people listening about the physical reality of other beings in other solar systems in this universe versus homo sapien on Earth? Well, if they are from a different density of consciousness or dimension, they, the interactions, the common interactions with objects will be the same that we are actually experiencing in our own reality. Because actually, in terms of physics, when we touch something, we're not really, our atoms inside our bodies are not really touching, let's say, literally, the atoms of the object itself. There is an electromagnetic repulsion. So because everything is energy, if we're talking about another dimension, a higher dimension, a higher frequency, even if it's higher and less dense, less material, it doesn't mean that that electromagnetic repulsion is not happening. So it wouldn't pass through it. It will actually touch it. If the object is at the same, let's say, frequency signature, in terms of dimension. But if you change the distance in atoms, yes, the slightest, then our hand would pass through. Yes. And that is another aspect of all of this that has always been a challenge to me as an investigative reporter interviewing so many people in the abduction syndrome in which they are describing their own awe at being floating through a room, floated through a window, floated through a ceiling, and they are aware that they are in some form that they think is their body, but it has the ability to go through a ceiling or a window. Yes. And that implies that the intelligences that abduct humans have the ability to control the distances of atoms and molecules they are what's happening is that they are abducting the holographic um, blueprint 
of that physical material consciousness of ours. So because that hologram is made of light, it's not materialized or crystallized into this density, this level of density, it's vibrating on a higher frequency. Therefore, this third dimensional physical object will be able to, we will be able to pass through it with our hands because that holographic um, blueprint of our body is at a higher rate. So there's no interference, let's say, in terms of electromagnetic waves. And finally, what is it that you think happens at the moment of death for Homo sapiens? There is a reintegration with what we call the higher mind, but it happens how it develops or how it gets to how we get to that point. It's totally unique for everyone because it's based on your belief system, a combination of your belief system, your experience, your connections, your decision on a higher level. It's a mix of many different things. Do you think reincarnation is real? It is. What is your definition of reincarnation? It's when the soul has decided to uh, move its perspective or point of experience into a, let's say, parallel incarnation of its own on the material or physical matrix. It's not linear because everything is happening at the same time, in the same now. There was a U.S. Air Force captain who was at a crash retrieval site in 1949. This is different from the 47 Roswell. This is different. But it was in the same region. And he had a telepathic exchange with one of the bodies lying in the craft. And it was as if the being not only was putting images in the Air Force captain's mind, but he felt like he, his entire face and everything was being pulled. That's how he found this being in the crash. And ultimately, he was assigned to stay with this being at Los Alamos lab for security until the being died on June 18, 1952, of unknown causes. And for about three years, every single day, the Air Force captain would come in front of a 16 millimeter camera, vast archives of this somewhere in the United States. And he would ask the being questions that he'd already prepared, and the being would do a download and it would be recorded. And one of his questions to the being that I was uh, given, is reincarnation real? And the answer that the Air Force captain says on the 16 millimeter film as being transmitted from the gray sitting next to him was, reincarnation, the recycling of souls, is the machinery of this universe. If reincarnation, the recycling of souls, is the machinery of this universe, what is the purpose of this universe? To get to know ourselves, our self as a general perspective, from many different points of view, infinitely, because time does never cease, and we never cease to, to exist, so that we're always in a constant state of expansion of our consciousness, such as God does with us. We are its infinite perspectives of itself, so that God knows itself from infinite points of view. Well, I just wanted to ask her if she can talk about the 22 genetics that went into you, and then one other question about the multi, because, no, you, it's the same. Okay, all right. And the three predominant races, because I think that was. Okay. Well, I was trying to get to that earlier, yeah. too, about the tall whites, the Nordics, right. the greys. The... I think her three are different. Okay. When you look back in your 22 years, uh, do you have a kind of list of non-humans who have interacted with you on a regular basis? Yes. I have, interaction, I have interacted with beings known as Arturians from the Buddhist constellation.
And what do they look like? They have large head, dark blue, purplish skin color. Any hair? No. So they would be about how tall? It varies depending on the soup race, but the ones I interacted with will be... I'm European, so I'm going to say it in, me in meters, <laughs> sorry. It's all right. <laughs> One point, not two meters, actually. About six and a half. Yes. So they're tall, yes. somewhat tall. No hair, a kind of purplish skin with very large yes. heads, and those are Arcturans. Yes. Now, what would be two others, maybe? Two other groups? Other groups? They, yeah, beyond um, the Arcturans. Andromedans. And what is their physical description? They usually have blue skin, but some of them can be human like us in terms of appearance. Uh, the ones I interacted with uh, mostly were blue skin too. And others will be the Nordics from Aldebaran. And others will be the reptilians, others will be the Kreis, and others, will, uh, the most predominant I will say are the blue skin Anunnakis from the Capricorn constellation. And that the Nordics yes. are the blonde blue eyes that have this complex that if they were if they were working through Hitler during World War II, you would think they would be an enemy, wouldn't you? Um, at the beginning Hitler was part of that positive agenda. But unfortunately, there was a negative influence on his avatar, and he took a path in which he actually um, started working with this draconian empire. But firstly, and that's why the Germans and the Nazis split into different groups, but originally he was working with the Aldebaran beings, and actually many people claim that he is an avatar of one Indian deity called Vishnu. Today, in 2022, near the end of the year, um, what would you say are the dominant extraterrestrial biological entity groups on Earth right now? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, in the end of 2022, as we're speaking, how would you describe the extraterrestrial biological entity groups that are on the earth right now? Um, some of them are human, very human looking and very inoffensive. Some of them are not human looking, but they take a holographic, let's say, appearance of a human body. They're using holoform holography. Exactly. But where would they be from? Many different places, such as Orion constellation, uh, Pleiades, or Sirius. And these groups would be here now because why? Depending. Some of them are here for experience, for exchange of information, for assistance of our evolution. But some of them, unfortunately, are here for an agenda. If reincarnation is real and the whole issue of souls is one of the most important subjects about human life, even if we don't understand it, and that you and other abductees say that the, you have made some kind of soul agreement for when you are born in a matter form on Earth, you're going to have a relationship with a specific type of non-human. Then some people reach a point and say, I don't want this agreement anymore. What is your reaction to your soul agreement with the Blues or the Nordics that you have? Well, I'm happy with the agreements with these positive beings, but I'm obviously not happy with the agreements with the Grace and their breeding programs and agendas. So at the beginning, when I started sharing my story in the community, Many spiritual people will be using spiritual teachings or metaphysical knowledge to justify or even romanticize the idea of being taken and being abused to do this kind of breeding programs and agendas and they will even um, state that it was for the best of humanity. 
And so I decided that I do not want to be part of the grace breeding program because I believe humanity can evolve naturally, organically, without genetic manipulation from one specific gray, uh, gray um, species. So there was a point in my life in which I said no. And so many people came to me and said, well, you made an agreement, you know this knowledge, you know that you, on a higher level, agreed to this, so there's a soul contract. Now you have to experience and grow past that and accept it. And I said no. You know why? Because we are in constant creation. We are creators. We are creator beings. We are in constant control of our own life. We are responsible for our own existence and our own creations and the creation of our reality. So we have the right to say, I no longer agree with this agreement. I no longer agree with this soul contract. I want to change it. I want to break it. You can do it because you are sovereign, you're free, you're from source. Everyone is at the same level. Nobody should be on top of you. So I responded to them that actually you can't change it. It is possible because you are creator too. So there, ne there needs to be less spiritual bypassing in the community and more understanding that we need to get to that phase of rebellion as a whole species and say, we are sovereign, we can say no, we can recreate contracts in the now moment because the power of creation lies in the now moment. Did you get a counter argument from the beings that you were making that presentation to? The greys, for example. What did they do? They attacked me to almost death. And how did they attack you? I, I think I explained already before. It's when but, I told you. But fresh now. How did they attack you? They psychically attacked me um, with psychic energy that was being projected to the to, let's say, um, interfere with the orientation of my Merkaba or my auric field, that is vortex energy that are spinning into, you know, contradictory um, directions, orientations, opposite orientations. So that made the physical body to almost, to this, um, become unstable. All the health parameters become unstable and almost made me to dematerialize, to pass away. And what did you do? I got a download from my star family, my contacts, in which they explain me the whole dynamics on, of, of their attack and how to get past it and survive. And they said, breathing is the key to your survival because breathing is how those magnetic, let's say, vortex of energies are always constantly in balance with each other. Is an electromagnetic breathing is an, an electromagnetic exchange with the medium. So I control my breathing, and by getting into a state of meditation and tuning into my whole auric field and vortex energies, I imagine and projected this vision of orientation and stability and I manage to survive. Can you say, are you, aren't you saying no from the 3D level and the spiritual bypass said, no, well you made an agreement on this higher level and you're saying no from the human level and that the higher dimension overrides the supposed this is the spiritual bypass. So what do you say to those people because you're saying no on the yeah. human level? Okay. Go ahead, you can answer to me. Yeah. Yes. Well, interesting question. Repeat yes. the question a little bit. Yes, they said, they said that, it's true. They said, you're saying no in the lower level, in the material level, but you don't, because you don't understand that actually in a higher level you're saying yes. And I said, no, you know why? Because the above is the below, and the below is the above. That's one of the most uh, known metaphysical laws in this universe, in, in this field. So when we get the desire to say no 
to change direction, to change contract, to change orientation into what we are actually creating and manifesting in our physical reality. That doesn't come from the below, just. That comes also from the above. It's also our higher mind coming through us, sending that information down to us. So there's no separation between the five dimension and the third dimension. There is only a disintegration of perception, but there's no separation. We are always collaborating with it on a multidimensional dynamic. Except that humans have been abused for the last 45,000 years since that crossfade with Neanderthal in the, this way. We have never been told the truth about our existence in a universe with a myriad of consciousnesses and extraterrestrial biological entities. And that means then that humanity in its evolution from Homo erectus into a lot of different forms and coming up to Homo sapiens sapiens has literally been abused by denial of information about the evolution of soul. And until that is, I think, affirmed, humanity is never ever going to be totally free to evolve. To be honest, um, what I've been told, a secret that not many people know, that I've been told about human history, that ties to that question, is that the fall of Atlantis was, let's say, caused on purpose. Because at that level, we were at the degree of being superhumans, which means that we were this close to becoming free and sovereign from those beings. But they twisted behind the scenes the karmic cycles of patterns that we contain within our DNA collective blueprint so that we will become unstable and then be vulnerable for a catastrophe to be in, you know manifested in our physical matrix and wipe us out and separate us into different directions some of them went to antarctica and to inner earth and those are the beings that we call the inner earth beings they are our ancestors the ones that didn't let's say split into different directions and that's why they contain this wisdom because they never lost it and the purpose behind the ones in the surface being you know um split in different directions and and being complete conflict with the catastrophe is so that they will lose this knowledge they will lose tradition and they will then be able to be more more keen to be ma manipulated by the Anunnaki's that they would be manipulated by these other extraterrestrials the humans exactly yeah there was an agenda behind the fall of Atlantis I really want to thank you for a discussion today that I think that all of humanity needs to have these words with each other. And the problem is humans are not understanding most of it because we have been purposely denied the truth from the 45,000 years ago when cro Homo sapiens sapiens stood up for the first time. And it is an interesting question to me, how much longer do you think it would be for Earth and humanity on Earth to finally be able to have this discussion that you and I had today with each other? I think the time is getting closer because um, to be honest, if somebody by, even by their perception of what they would call coincidence, gets to hear this interview or any other interview in which this kind of information is being exchanged or shared, I wouldn't call it a coincidence. I will call it synchronicity. I will say that they, on a higher level, has stepped up, you know, with this, has uh, encountered this information, not by 
serendipity or by coincidence, you know, accidentally, but rather because they are designing on a higher level. And it may be that it is the soul itself that becomes aware of what it must do next to continue its evolution and that the soul sometimes determines these steps. Exactly. It's a complex orchestration of many different dynamics and steps.